Hello, everyone. Welcome to another round of event by Pier 71 Port Innovation Ecosystem Reimagined at Block 71. Today's event is a little special. It's a special edition as we meet at InnoFest and Elevating Founders Asia, the official startup event of Asia Tech Singapore 2021. So Pier 71 brings together a vibrant ecosystem of innovative thinkers, entrepreneurs, startup founders, maritime veterans and experts, technology, entrepreneurial know-how and investment opportunities. And I'm Ning, and together with me, I have Jessica, and we'll be hosting you today. Yep, that's right. So if you're looking for new innovative solutions in the maritime space, you're at the right place. So today we have an exciting panel discussion coming right up where we'll get to hear from panelists who will share their views on how to sustain and grow the current maritime innovation ecosystem and nurture startups towards reaching greater heights. So our panel today will be moderated by Mr. Thomas Ting, the Chief Technology Officer of the Maritime and Port Authority. Thomas has extensive experience developing Singapore as a key maritime tech hub or marine tech hub. He will be joined by Naku Mahotra, Vice President of Open Innovation from Wilhelmson Ship Services, Heyman Sinapias, Investment Manager from InnoPort, Marianne Chu, Co-Founder of Claritex, and Nidhi Gupta, CEO and Co-Founder of Podcast. Claritex and Podcast are also our graduates from Pier 71's SmartPort Challenge program. Now, don't go away after the panel discussion because we will be sharing more about the SmartPort Challenge perfect opportunity for tech entrepreneurs who have technologies to reimagine for the maritime industry. And over to you, Thomas. It is often said that the success of a startup depends on the strengths of its product market fit, its ability to scale, and also the founders and team competence. What role does the ecosystem have in supporting this? And what environment makes it right for startups to grow? As the maritime technology sector increasingly ventures into innovative solutions from the startup world, our experts weigh in on what aspects of the ecosystem would be most important for growth and how we can nurture that. So I'm going to start with a, a broad question uh, focusing on ecosystems. Uh, for all the panelists here, we have a growing maritime innovation ecosystem in Singapore. Do you think we need to achieve certain critical mass of actors to self-sustain and grow the ecosystem? If yes, how should this critical mass look like in future? If no, um, what are the reasons? Maybe you can share our views. Why don't I just jump straight in if, if that's okay? Um, I think the short answer, uh, the short answer to your question, Thomas, and, and first of all, let me just say I'm super excited to be on the on the panel today um, following both Claritex and Portcast development and, and just taking a look at how Singapore's ecosystem has been developing. So let me come back to, to your question. The, the short answer is yes, uh, it definitely needs to achieve a critical mass. Um, what it looks like is really, I think, um, I think the first thing is that um, really to be able to have a, a value chain thinking and, and really participants from every stakeholder within that value chain. I think that's absolutely critical from an adoption perspective and attraction perspective. Um, I think maritime is, is really interconnected. And so it's quite easy to believe that a one-to-one -one relationship in an ecosystem is, is good enough and it really isn't. Um, I think that end-to-end -end representation, end-to-end -end participation, starting with the value chain thinking is a really important. And then hopefully uh, seeing it evolve into much more a value network type setup uh, where, where you can see that the power of the ecosystem and the network orchestration capability of that ecosystem takes over the individual partnerships that might be part of that ecosystem. And I think that's super critical. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. I would uh, say it's quite quite difficult to define uh, sort of what the critical mass is here because we have so many different stakeholders and for a lot of the innovation challenges, we need the collaboration of a lot of those stakeholders. And I mean, to that, of course, uh, we, we, have the, we have the corporates, we have the startups, we have the government playing uh, their parts in all of that. And Mm, yeah, I think we, we, we certainly need um, need all of them to, to play their part. For corporates, it would be to maybe be a little more open. Maritime is obviously a very conservative industry. It's very difficult to get uh, the, the adoption. Uh, for startups, yeah, I mean, you, uh, Thomas, you were talking about the product market fit um, and we, uh, the 
the collaboration between the different stakeholders, between the corporates, between the startups will certainly help to achieve that. And um, that is something where I believe we can improve quite a bit. And uh, yeah, of course, the, the government we we uh, needs we need support from from the regulatory perspective, from uh, yeah financial incentives as well. And uh, yeah, I think that uh, that that will sort of give the 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 boost to reach a critical mass. I think, as I said in the beginning, very difficult to define that specifically what that would be. Yeah, um, as a startup, I totally agree with what the gentlemen have just said. Um, the critical mass actually needs to come also from, from the corporates uh, who want to digitize it and transform and to implement all these solutions. Um, like from the MPA Maritime Digitalization Playbook, which was published last year, we could see that the SMEs, for instance, which form the bulk of our maritime companies in Singapore, are at only the digital starter or the digital literate stage. So this poses, I will see it as a, a very positive stage, actually. Uh, it's a great opportunity for us startups or, or tech companies to address this gap and a lot more innovation will then follow. And that's how we could possibly uh, reach our critical mass in the future. Uh, maybe from my perspective, you know, when I was thinking about this question, um, if you think about, uh, you know, what we can look out for, like uh, what Singapore could look up to, uh, let's think about Israel, you know, how they could become uh, could have become a tech startup hub for maritime companies. And I was reading somewhere that there are about 50 companies out of uh, 6,000 startups. So that's about 1% uh, that, uh, that exist in Israel in terms of maritime startups. I think that is still quite a high number. Like if we were to count that for Singapore, I think it would be a lot lower percentage in terms of the startups that exist in Singapore, given the scope of the you know global scale of hub and the port operations and the uh, the headquarters of large companies that we have here. So I think there is definitely something that we can pick up from there. And I think what is interesting is what Israel has done is that they've brought in the mix of what the government can do, um, what the Navy can bring, um, and the academic and R&D research institutions, and then bringing that talent. Uh, and they've sort of proven that they could do deep tech and their technology is you know, much advanced than anyone else. Uh, and you know that's something that they can be proud about. So, and, and that has then allowed them to reach the institutions and the corporates and get the customers at a global scale, not just in Israel, because it's very similar to Singapore, right? The market itself is very small, but the platform it allows companies to then target customers at a global scale, I think that's where the advantage comes in. So I think those are the things that we could really look at in terms of what Israel and similar company, countries have done. Um, but so, so I, I really believe it's really about building that tech advantage through all of these complementary actors, um, but then working at a global scale, bringing that technology at a global scale. Um, and I think that would uh, enhance uh, the position of Singapore in terms of maritime startups. Thank you. Yeah, you know, we have uh, made known our ambition uh, to grow a number of uh, maritime technology startups uh, in Singapore ecosystems from today. Of course, we accelerated uh, much more than that, but, you know, based on those pure play maritime tech companies, 30 over to uh, more than 100 in a few years time. And I uh, was just wondering in terms of the ambition uh, compared to another sector, which is very successful. I mean, all of us know the fintech sector uh, has been leading the way in terms of the success. Um, they actually, according to numbers, they have like uh, over a thousand fintech companies in Singapore. Uh, clearly, that is the, uh, quite quite a critical uh, mass of companies there. And uh, just um, last year, I heard they attracted that sector attracted over one billion uh, of investment uh, into the ecosystem. And just the first half of this year, already attracted um, uh, one billion of investments. And uh, in terms of the maritime Singapore, uh, I, I will see we are still at the nascent stage of development as a maritime tech companies um, and as a hub. We have no unicorn. We have a very few gazelles. We have a many early stage uh, startups. And uh, I, I just want to hear in your view, what else we can do to actually increase the number and quality of scale ups, as well as number of deal flows uh, investment into maritime, marine tech, marine tech. Uh, startups. So I, uh, I think um, that's a really interesting question, right? So, so you've set it up well, like what's the, what's the delta? What has to happen? Um, I think you bring up a really important point because if you look at 
kind of success stories, the ratios at the moment look like, and, and you're right. I, I think it's it's kind of like one in a thousand maybe that are that are going to go on to, uh, you know, unicorn status. I think the, I think there's a couple of things that we should be aware of. Number one, I think that there's still too much comparison of the maritime tech uh, space with B 2 C kind of startups. What good looks like, and I think that you know we've got to get away from that. I think in the maritime space, what good looks like is different. And that's just the reality. It's similar to the B2B space wider. Um, I think uh, ultimately it's a confluence of, uh, or an intersection of capacity, culture, and competence. And then the culture is really, you know, trying to get this entrepreneurial spirit that is then combined with tech talent, combined with finance. And I think the reality is that uh, maritime tech is still, as you said, really nascent, which means that the funnel of post-series B players is really thin. That's just the reality. There's a lot of pre-seed, seed, and that's going to eventually flow its way through maturity. Um, it's going to take a little bit of time. And I think that's where the uh, that's where the corporate connection, that's where the um, sort of what I think is a nuanced traction pathway connecting maritime corporates, navigating this nuances with startups helps to helps to build that up quite dramatically. But we also have to recognize that maritime is rather different in terms of its regulatory landscape. It, it sits within international regulations for it to really be successful as opposed to you know, purely single national regulation. And I think that's something that's really important. Um, it's at the cusp of, um, rather than regulation triggering innovation, it's actually at the cusp of innovation triggering regulation. And we see that whether it's in last mile delivery, drone spaces, 3D printing, we see it in uh, also in the decarbonization space where the innovation is actually moving faster uh, than the regulation, although obviously the regulation is, is a starting point, right? Um, so I think, I think regulatory sandboxing is an extremely important element for marine tech uh, and that has to be really scaled up quite dramatically uh, so that the gap between regulatory sandboxing and operational implementation is, is collapsed. And, and whatever other stakeholders we need, whether it's class societies or uh, local and international regulators coming in, uh, as well as national regulators, that really is, is quite critical. Um, I think the second thing is that just, and I mean this in the best possible way, but we've got to increase awareness of where maritime is in terms of people's lives. I mean, you know, uh, fintech, pure tech, they, they, it's really cool to be part of those companies and to be in that space. And so primary talent tends to, tends to migrate there. Uh, I'm a fan of creating a tag on every department store's product saying brought to you by MV whatever, so that people recognize that our lives are really dependent on goods moving from A to B and shipping holds a really big place in that. We sometimes forget, right? Things just appear magically until they don't appear or the Suez Canal gets blocked. And then we remember that shipping is really important. And I think, I think you know, this relationship to an industry having a critical element to personal lives makes that industry a little bit more attractive. And then the final one I think is part of the awareness is this is a time machine. This is where people who have worked in FinTech or in inshore tech or in deep tech can sit in a time machine go into maritime and go back like it's 1995. And they know exactly what has to be done because they've done it before. And, and they can use that almanac of success and come back into this space and actually make a really big difference. I mean, it's like back to the future. It's fantastic. You know what's going to work. You, and so you just have to bring that in and connect people in. So I think we've got to really amp up the excitement that this space can offer. Um, and that'll attract both finance and talent and create the culture that we need. Mm, well, where I mean, the, the, the first two points, I, I fully agree on, on, on the last one. Is it, is it actually really replicable? Uh, that is uh, one challenge that I see quite often between uh, startups entering that space from founders from, uh, who come from, from different areas. Because 
the maritime industry can be quite unique, uh, has some quite unique characteristics. It's quite complex, very international. Uh, so, and sort of a lot of people very set in their ways, especially in terms of sort of the, the, in, in the corporates. And that makes it quite, quite difficult uh, for some of them. So, uh, yes, we have to sort of get, get the excitement going among, among uh, more founders to enter the maritime space. Uh, but I think in terms of ecosystem building, it uh, would really help um, now from Singapore's perspective, maybe to, yeah, to, to really analyze the, 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 the problems where they can incentivize the sort of adoption within, within corporate, see where the problems lie, where, where adoption is missing. Because for so many startups, I, see, I see, see problems between sort of the partnership between the startup and the corporate and the adopters. And that's where I think we need to improve massively. In, in Singapore, there are already quite a lot of um, opportunities, funding or grant opportunities for, for early adopters. But I think we need to do uh, a bit more here uh, to see that we that we bridge that gap from the sort of hip tech world to this ultra conservative uh, maritime um, maritime world. I think that would be very important uh, in a first step. Mm. Yeah, and then yeah, the, 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 uh, to to attract good talent, of course, is another issue which was which was mentioned before. So we we, we certainly need to be able to make it easy for uh, for talent for for young for young startups, also maybe also more mature startups because those are missing in the in the current ecosystem, right? Because it's a very young it's a very young ecosystem globally, I would say. So that um, those are the areas I think we need to focus on to uh, in addition to. What Naku said already. Yeah, I like I like what Naku said. Um, translated in short, it's like no shipping, no shopping, right? <laughs> um, so if it really in in Singapore, if you look at some of these startups that we have here, um, it's quite a paradox because a lot of them when they start is just focus on on one idea and they try to make it happen. They go on POCs. Uh, trying to scale it up um, with, with the corporates and things like that. Um, and we realized that, um, well, Claritex for one, is that if we just depend on that, on bunkering only, it is really a very small and niche market. Um, and what maritime startups would probably have to do if they want to consider themselves moving up to the scale-up stage or, or even to be considered as a gazelle one day, um, is that they need to diversify. Um, we started with operations. We can go on to like maybe with shipping agencies, with other uh, husbandry services, whereby everybody would be able to come onto a common platform, use this sort of data, um, and get you know clarity and transparency in, in all their operations. Um, moving ahead is to go on internationally. Um, how we can bring this across to to other huge ports as a start and then to, to expand it um, into, again, uh, further, further verticals or to tie up with FinTech and everything. We shouldn't really just focus on just maritime alone. Um, we really have to broaden our perspectives, our options, our solutions, so that um, clients could then see the value that's bringing to their businesses and sign on with us. Yeah. Um, so I think, uh, you know, Singapore is, is a great place to build a, a maritime startup and um, now is probably the most exciting time uh, to be in this space. Um, so I think, I think of four things. One, I think we have to make, make noise. I think we have to do PR. I think we have to position um, uh, uh, globally what Singapore is doing in terms of maritime tech, but also each startup itself. Like that's what we realize for ourselves. Like we need to be, you know, COVID has kind of enabled that customers can work with companies based anywhere. And especially if it's a SaaS AI technology company like us, we, we, there is no hindrance to work with a company headquartered out of Europe or US. Um, so it's re it really comes down to how, how much noise you're creating, how much positioning you have, and is that a global brand that you're building? Um, so I think you know the same then goes in terms of the whole ecosystem. So I think that's the first thing. The second is obviously talent. To build a quality startup or a scale up, 
there is there is there is no other um, sort of magic than the people who build it. Um, I was just talking to another co another founder uh, today, and uh, we were exchanging notes. And the company is based in India, and I realized that their burn on uh, the people spend is one fourth of our burn. We might be at similar stages in terms of the number of people, etc., but their burn is one fourth of it. Of course, we get quality talent here, and you know we're you know that's that's kind of the advantage of uh, of, of Singapore. But still, it is very expensive uh, for a for a company to uh, find the right resources. And uh, I think you know talent is definitely what will make or break a company and the ecosystem. So I think that's kind of the second thing. Uh, any other sort of areas, any other creative options we have to be able to bring that talent, not just from tech but also from the industry, to allow people to be able to take that risk to jump into and create a startup. You know, I. Like like Heyman said, someone needs to understand what is this space and how is tech, tech going to rep, sort of bring those ripples and create innovation. Um, and to allow a person who's worked in a corporate setup to you know sort of take the leap of faith and build a company, I think that is also something that we have to enable. Uh, so that's also what I mean in terms of talent. And the third, I think it it is up to the it it is up to then the talent to bring traction. Um, I think what is uh, what could uh, enhance that is. The advantage of Singapore is the regional headquarters that you could work with. Um, the next step is how you can bring that technology from the regional to the global headquarters and make it global. Um, so I think that's kind of where the startup and the corporates have to work together and make sure that these are not just experiments or proof of concepts, but these are globally replicable technologies that we are building. Um, so again, that comes down to you know the quality of tech uh, and uh, the quality of understanding the space. And then finally, I would also say um, it's about thought leadership. So it's about involving all those different actors that uh, Thomas, you mentioned earlier, how we can bring those actors together, but then creating that thought leadership, which is continuous. So it's not, it's not you know, sort of disparate uh, places or times in the year when, when people are talking and figuring out what to do, but it's like a thought leadership, which comes from different actors and who are constantly working on a plan on how to build uh, the, the, the number of scale-ups in the ecosystem. So those are the things that I would think uh, we can do more of. Yeah, thank you. So I hear that uh, the regulatory sandbox uh, from NACO is very important in terms of creating the en enabling environment because maritime is a highly regulated uh, industry. And if you don't allow drones to fly easily, underwater vehicles, autonomous uh, vehicles, then um, a lot of this experimentation is going to be very slow. So uh, that is an important aspect. Uh, hearing from Nidhi uh, that um, the talent aspect is uh, also extremely important and kind of we don't have really a natural advantage because the talent uh, in Singapore is, is not the cheapest uh, and uh, therefore a kind of a strategy to distribute our talents around the world doing uh, the, the kind of a thing that's in their strengths uh, will be a kind of a strategy that you will be pursuing. And uh, if uh, Subsequently, we can also talk about how, what else you can do in terms of the talent landscape to help uh, companies and startups here to actually uh, grow and scale. Uh, that would be something very useful. Uh, but I just want to go back to uh, the investment part, which uh, back to uh, Wilhelmson uh, and also Innoport. Uh, since you have been investing and partnering startups over the number of years, and uh, I just want to hear from you, how would you uh, evaluate and measure a good investment uh, into into startups. <laughs> yeah, you, want the, you, you want the you uh, want the you want the secret sauce to the bets that we make. Look, um, I think I think a little bit is related to to uh, what was discussed previously, and one of the points that Heyman mentioned um, is there is it is it a hundred percent replicable like the solutions we see? No, obviously not. I mentioned maritime is nuanced. Uh, at the same time, fundamentally, the layering of data to information, to knowledge, to insight, to action uh, is, is not different. So there's a lot of stuff that is definitely nuanced. At the same time, I think we do have to recognize that a lot of stuff is also um, kind of there's a defensive approach, right? And that's what we need to break down. Uh, and that's the bit that I think is is replicable. And so in our investment decisions and in our investment thesis or partnership uh, thesis, a couple of different lenses, and I think this is really critical. Uh, number one is when we are looking at solutions and we're looking at uh, potential um, 
offerings from in, in the startup space or you know in the venture space as such. Uh, we're, we're really conscious of the fact whether we're looking at it from a consumption lens or whether we're looking at it from a co-creation lens. And that's really important for us uh, because some of those solutions make a lot of sense. They'll improve our internal efficiencies, but it's not something that we can probably help uh, take to market. It's not something that we can mass uh, adopt or take traction in the wider market, but of course we can use it. And I think a consumption lens lends itself to a completely different decision-making in terms of the maturity we would require, in terms of it being a lot more procurement-based. And I think one of the things that really kill corporate startup relationships is when a corporate is having a consumption lens, says it's having a co-creation lens, and then puts in an exclusivity clause that they're not allowed working with any other company. Like that doesn't work, right? So I think that's something that we're really focused on. Um, with the co-creation lens, what we're really looking at is we're looking at how can we use our corporate capabilities to bring something to the table. There's a lot of talk of smart capital. So a lot of it is, you know, what is that smartness that needs to come in with the capital? What can we do to really help adoption, traction? Is there a joint go to market? And ultimately it's because what we're really looking at is can we combine our corporate capability to participate in new business models, new offerings that help us stay relevant for the future? So one of the things that we're really focused about is, is, you know, we don't believe that Porter's five forces is static for today. So our competition of today and our suppliers of today is not necessarily going to be static going tomorrow. So if that is dynamic, then how do we stay relevant going forward? And that's a big part of our investment decision. Um, obviously, the financial returns is an element, but strategic allocation, participation, go-to-market, adoption, traction, so that is there something here in this partnership that allows us to stay relevant for the future and allows the startup to get some sort of magic sauce in terms of traction. And I think that's really important for us. Yeah, how about uh, Heyman from Innoport? Uh, you've been quite active in investing uh, in the startups uh, space. So uh, what are some of the key uh, lessons that you have learned along the way investing in these uh, startups in recent years? Sure. I mean, for, for us, we are a, a corporate VC unit, right? So we, we do both uh, return-driven and strategic investments, but all sort of around the sort of blue, blue economy space with uh, maritime and uh, logistics and adjacent sec uh, sectors. But as well, mm, the the Schulte Group has uh, covers a lot of different verticals. I mean, with, with the main ones being ship owning and ship management, but uh, various uh, uh, various other services as well. So I think we can we can offer uh, startups uh, quite often a lot of industry expertise, experts, aspiring partners, and can engage with them uh closely so that 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 i would also say is sort of where where our investment decision goes towards where we say where where can we actually add value uh to the startup where can the startup add value to our operations we have a lot of development capabilities in house as well but uh in uh, in the innovation space and uh, you need quite often fresh ideas different ideas different approaches maybe um coming in from uh, from other from other industries as well. So as as we discussed uh, before, right? So that's um, that's a very um, yeah that's a very interesting journey to 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 see all that. Um, we yeah I think the lessons learned is a is an interesting one because as a, uh, as I said it's quite a complex industry and uh, with. Um, We've seen that that sales cycles are quite a bit longer for some particular reasons. Uh, I think one of the major ones is that you see very often uh, potential customers, the top level management saying, oh, this sounds great. It will make us more efficient. It will be fantastic for us to, to adopt uh, a solution. And then when it comes to actually implementing solution and you're talking to the ops guys, to the middle management, there you'll face a lot of resistance. Uh, middle management and shipping, you often have um, staff who maybe spend 20 years on a vessel, 20 years uh, uh, on shore, and now you come with uh, a totally different idea, uh, you probably will face resistance and hesitation. And that's why, why very often it takes 
it takes uh, longer to um yeah to to get adoption within and to sort of get the discussion going that's why i'm saying uh, or <laughs> repeatedly saying that we need more collaboration and incentivize the collaboration between the innovators the inno and the innovative brains within the the startups and and the corporates so i think this is uh, this is one of the yeah one, one of the sort of uh, le learnings that we have which i would um, yeah also um ask other corporates to sort of yeah maybe maybe be be open to discussion open innovation williamson is a great example uh that uh, where you can have uh yeah discussions and collaborations with and that is something fairly fairly rare in the shipping industry uh, a lot of shipping companies work very close books and that is something we need to break to to drive the ecosystem forward yeah thank you Heyman. Uh, maybe uh, also want to hear from the startup uh, lenses in terms of, you know, as the corporates, uh, CVCs, uh, investors choose the startups, but I'm sure startups also uh, need partners and they also choose some of their strategic partners and investors. So what are the things that you keep a lookout for in the partnerships that will be strategic to you? I mean, Nidhi and uh, uh, I, I think, Marion, you have your fair share of uh, experience in terms of finding the right partners and sometimes you land with the wrong partners um, for whatever reasons. Maybe you can share some uh, views about uh, what are the things you look out for in the in the strategic partnerships uh, within the ecosystems. Uh, Thomas, you you're referring to uh, uh, the investors, the fund source fund partners. Or... Uh, partners in the ecosystem, they are they are probably two type. One will be more in terms of the the corporate partners who want to co-create the solutions with you. Yeah. Oh, and I, I mean, the corporates uh, want to work with startups for various reasons, right? Yeah. Some of them, uh, they want to acquire solutions. Some, they want to search for talents and yeah. get new ideas. So this, this is one category. Uh, another one a category is actually the investors, yes. um, you know, yeah. Okay. So from our, uh, from our uh, uh, customer perspective, from the corporate's perspective, I think the best partners have been who really, um, you know, uh, know how to experiment with a startup. So they know that, um, there needs to be a, a, a critical business case. There needs to be an end game to end goal to what they want to get out of this experiment. Um, and they move fast. So, you know, it either fails or it succeeds and then they move fast. Um, rather than, uh, you know, corporates where we've had like, you know, a hundred uh, questions on cybersecurity and, you know, proper procurement process just to start an experiment. Um, and that takes like, in one case, it take, took a year to get to an experiment. And that kind of, you know, sort of dissuades the startup from working in that particular segment. Um, because our funds are limited, our teams are limited, we just need to put the resources at the right place. So I think that's kind of a good and a not so good side of a corporate partner. Um, fund, funding partner, from our perspective, we work with two kinds of uh, uh, investors. One who have uh, experience in the, in the space we're in, uh, in either logistics or maritime, who understand the customers, the challenges, the go-to-market, the, 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 the pain point that the customers have, and they can guide the direction in which we move the product. The second, in terms of uh, who know how to build a startup, who know how to take a startup to a scale-up and then to the gazelle that you were talking about. So I think those are the two kinds of partners we look for. And uh, you know, honestly, Singapore has been really great, I think, uh, to, to have a platform to get to work with such partners. And I definitely have to also give credit to uh, the ecosystem that the government has created in terms of, you know, all the various funds and resources that, that are provided as well. Um, yeah. Marianne. Uh, Marianne. I say the same thing as well. Um, very much thankful for the ecosystem that uh, Singapore has built, uh, without which I think um, we wouldn't be sitting here today as well. Um, I think I'll, I'll start off with, with like the clients that we have. Um, yes, we've had the good ones. Um, currently, we are doing a POC with Williamson and um, the ship services division has been very helpful in helping us co-create um, a solution that goes beyond bunkering into shipping services, um, into providing um, it's husbandry services, how we do scheduling for, for all the various other chains. And that has opened our eyes um, to really the pain points of what they are, they are handling um, and what we could come up with as a solution. So um, it really puts into perspective as to how we can 
co-create together, um, how we collaborate and, and we're grateful for, for that um, opportunity to have worked with uh, Williamson on this. Um, we also get the other spectrum of um, clients whom expect a small little startup to fund the whole project. Um, it could be quoting already by two, three hundred thousand to build a, a system. And they would say that, well, for us to start, okay, let's go through the due diligence of it, the tech. Um, oh, have you done a penetration test for the system and things like that? And after like six months of deliberation, they said, well, uh, we can only do it if you're going to pay for it. Um, a small startup really um, does not have that sort of um, deep pockets to finance you know, such, such a project. So we've had to walk away also at, at times. Um, so that's why we are really um, privileged and um, dependent on good uh, mentors and our investors, whom we are very grateful. Um, the Innoport for one um, saw that we could possibly be a potential uh, scale up in the future. Um, they were really the ones um, to help us through and weather the storm of 2020. Um, so I'll just want to say thank you to Heyman for, for all this. <laughs> um, and it is not really to suck up to him or to, to anyone, basically. Um, it is really saying the truth from, from the heart of, of many startups who maybe have not even managed to, to get to this stage. Um, probably a lot of them have already dropped off, um, you know, within the last year, for instance. So um, we are grateful for, for the sort of um, information, uh, opening of doors for us to, to potential clients, and now uh, we are raising funds for pre-Series A and we've uh, also secured some strategic investors. So they have also come on with um, beyond just the promise of uh, monetary support, but with um, solutions, with um, ideas of how we could go on to, to greater heights. So um, yeah, I, I think it, it really takes um, a lot of understanding and camaraderie between like, like investors, um, the startups, um, a lot of good level-headed advice, you know, to proceed on from just being a small little startup. Yeah. Thomas, if I can, I just want to pick up something uh, that was discussed in, in this round here that is really closely linked um, into what the ecosystem requires. Just as much as we need entrepreneurial talent, we actually need entrepreneurial talent as well. We need talent and competence within corporates who can understand how to navigate the corporate, how to navigate the innovation space. What are the expectations on this difference between procuring something, which will happen to, but versus co-creating something? And I think that's that's kind of an important skill set that, that I'd love to see a lot more maritime corporates trying to imbibe, trying to get on. And I think that's that's what's going to make this whole thing a lot more vibrant. Yeah, thanks, Nako. To, to your point, uh, you know, we have set up the circle of uh, digital innovators and circle of uh, child officers to push uh, those things on innovation fronts for the ecosystems. Uh, in our view, what else we can do, um, you know, to get uh, more corporates, more maritime companies to actually uh, embrace uh, innovation, uh, working with startups and uh, do experimentations, uh, whether intrapreneur or working with ex uh, external innovators, what else can be done? Yeah. So I think let me start by saying that, look, you know, the maritime digitalization playbook, the, the CDO network, CHRO network, uh, the grants and the funding are, are all great starts. And I think that that, that shouldn't be uh, that shouldn't be discounted or underestimated. At the same time, I'm going to say that they're great starts because uh, really the success will be a factor of how much adoption and how much more vibrancy we can get. And I think I think we need to recognize that the maritime industry is, is really what I call a, a triangular hierarchy. Uh, you have the top, maybe, I'm going to pick numbers, right? And whether they're validated or not, I don't know. But you have the top 10% in the industry. They are the early adopters. They're going to be wanting to lead. They want to get into this space. And I think, you know, encouraging them, catalyzing them to do that is a great thing. 
you have the bottom 25% and they're not going to be able to participate. They, we're not going to see a future for the bottom 25%. And that's just the reality. And then you have the middle 65%. The middle 65% is what is going to make the difference to go to scale. They're the ones who want to participate in the future, but they're not the early adopters. They're going to see what are the winning solutions. And I think how we approach and engage these different hierarchies are different, what the entry points are different. I think that the middle 65% is really a lot more about consumption. Uh, I think the end-to-end approach, and I'm going to take an example, the 3D printing ecosystem in Singapore went from really an idea in a couple of people's head to something that is pretty vibrant now and growing and is generally acknowledged uh, that the Singapore maritime 3D printing ecosystem is one of the leading maritime 3D printing ecosystems. What happened? It was a joint industry program bringing in diverse players, starting to safely try out some of the parts on the ships, and then with very low barriers, bringing more players right from different parts of that value chain to come in in a very safe space and sharing good news stories, sharing success stories, but also sharing failures. And I think wherever we can create more forums, create safe spaces, I'm, I'm going to say always interesting to get more money from the government. So let's make no mistake about that. But I think in addition to that, creating those forums, cross industry, cross verticals, talent, all the usual stuff, but really an end-to-end thinking, not to confuse ecosystems with partnerships. These are two different things. Thank you. Yeah, Yeah, Heyman, please go ahead. Absolutely, I I, I I fully agree with that. So this is uh, this is something where we we need to keep the, the really a, a dialogue between the different different stakeholders in the industry, and we, we need to keep that very active. Uh, Pre COVID, we've seen that in Singapore uh, very very well. Of course, we had a, we have a very active uh, ecosystem already. Uh, during COVID, of course, it was very difficult to um, to meet up, and we can do only so much via Zoom and Teams, right? Um, that's a little bit of a of a problem, of course. Uh, but overall, you know, I think we just need to make sure that we keep the dialogue open between the corporates, between the startups, with the regulatory framework on top of that, and. Um, that uh, yeah, and then secondly, to make it yeah, at, I think that the point has also been raised to really attract uh, talent to Singapore, to make sure that we have the possibility to come from those few uh, or from the good number of early stage startups to the scale up stage, that I think will be very important. Yeah, thank you. I'm asked to inject some fun into this uh, panel. So we're going to do a bit of a role play here. Um, So, um, okay, let's go to Heyman first. Uh, You will be a government official. Uh, Imagine if you were the government looking to bring the ecosystem to the next level. Uh, What is the first thing you would do? I think I would go to the panel and listen to the to the to the experts from the industry. And uh, (laughs) because I think we... we, um, we heard a lot of very interesting points here today, uh, and the the Singapore maritime uh, startup ecosystem is already fa- fairly active. So I think the uh, uh, we have a very good basis to to, to build upon. So now we need to uh, bring it to that level where we have from the startups to a good number of scale-ups uh, and maybe think, as Nidhi said, more globally, sort of on a global scale. How can we get, because we have the international shipping companies uh, in the in the ecosystem as well. So uh, we need to make sure that we uh, get that uh, that bridge. So for, for that, um, yeah, I, I think it would be repetitive to go th- over over the, the points that we raised today. But I think uh, the, the the key points that the regulatory frameworks are there that we uh, can continue to test new technologies, whether it's in in the drone space that you mentioned or otherwise, that we can act fast because speed is of the essence for the startups. Right? They don't have uh, unlimited resources and can drag it on and on. So we need to be able to act fast. And that goes from 
uh, from appro approval to grants to the, the financing opportunities that the government gives. From uh, that perspective, I think you need to make sure that, that the regulatory framework and, and, the, and the speed and the administration is, uh, is given. Uh, the collaboration, I think, is one of the, 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 the key points that has been mentioned over and over again from different uh, perspectives today. And um, where I probably would uh, try to, uh, to aim first is, is, is really to get the, the collaboration with the startups going in a way that we improve product market fit. Because for, for many startups, especially those that, come, uh, that, that bring expertise and ideas from other industries, that needs to be improved because of the, 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 the mentioned complexities that we have in the, in the maritime industry. So make it to make, first of all, make it easy to bring in experts as well, because Singapore, there are not many Singapore seafarers who've actually served time on board uh, vessels. So uh, br bring in the necessary expertise um, and to encourage yeah, the, the dialogue through the mentioned um, networking opportunities that Nakul had mentioned. And on the other hand, the, the adoption. So there are um, funding opportunities through, the, through, the, through IMDA's uh, IDP grants. Uh, that is one of the very good examples, I think, how to steer it. But we could probably do more and maybe expand that also more towards the, corp the corporates. Because we, uh, if you only look from a perspective as a government saying, yes, the corporates, they probably have the resources to do it completely themselves. You still need to incentivize it if it doesn't happen, right? If we want to build that ecosystem, you need to make sure that you really uh, step in and see where are the showstoppers? Where does it slow down? And if, uh, if, if those opportunities, whether it's grant opportunities or otherwise, if those are um, maybe expanded uh, to, to a broader audience that we need for an ecosystem building, then uh, we, can, we can accelerate from, from the good base that we already have uh, in Singapore. How about you, Naku? You have seen so many startups uh, making pitch to you uh, from a corporate uh, VC perspective. Uh, if you were an entrepreneur, what, what would be the things uh, that would be top of your mind and what are the things that uh, as an entrepreneur we wouldn't do uh, to form a partnership with the corporates? So a couple of, a couple of different things. I think, first of all, uh, I'd make sure that I'm totally obsessed with the problem and not the solution. Uh, because I think that the solution is going to continuously change. And, and so if you're obsessed with the problem, you're more likely to get product market fit when you're talking to corporates. I think that's the first thing I would do. Uh, the second is really leverage on the mentors, the connections, the kind of innovators that are established out in the forums uh, to get access into the corporates that I'm targeting. So I'd be a little bit more obsessed about which corporates do I want to target first and which ones are going to be followers and which ones are going to do just because the other ones are going to do. So just to be able to you know, work that pyramid a little bit more smartly. Um, and the final one is when you get in, just to navigate the corporate thing, I think, I think really you know, um, find the, uh, understand the difference between, you know, there might be a top-down approach and a decision maker. That is not the end of the process. That is the start of the process. So do a lot more on the narrative of that middle management that act like the white blood cells. Work with them to convert the usage of the solution to go from this makes you irrelevant, which is what they're thinking, to this makes you look a lot better. So I would work on those three dimensions to really crack the crack the uh, the, the space. I think. How about the uh, Nidhi and uh, Marian? Uh, if you have been dealing with the corporates uh, over the years, and I mean, if you were wearing the hats of the corporates, uh, what what would be the things that uh, you would do to form a better partnership with uh, startups, especially you are new into this space of working in startups? Uh, what 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 are the things that you would do and you would not do? I think for me. Um... I would say, number one, have an open mind. Uh, you might just learn a thing or two from these young innovators who are looking at your problems with a fresh pair of eyes and no baggage. Two, um, be patient with them and manage your expectations because um, 
we've dealt with some corporates and they expect like ready-made solutions for their very complex problems. Um, well, basically that's not, not just not gonna happen, right? Um, we have to remember that startups are really new companies who are just starting up. Um, they may not even have the background, maritime knowledge, the, the expertise that, that you have built up over the years. So um, give them some of your patience, your time, your guidance, and let them draw upon your wealth of, of domain knowledge. I think from there, by, by doing so, they'll be able to empathize with your problem statement and come up with a really good solution. And um, maybe a third one is compensate the startup for running the POC with you, because really um, you don't expect that the, the startups to work for free, they're already really bootstrapped. So um, what I feel is that if they can't survive to the go to market, then it really is a wasted POC and a wasted solution. That's never going to see the light of day. Yeah. Uh, Thomas, these are great questions. I, I really like you swapped the roles. Um, you know, if I if I think about putting myself in the shoe of a, a, a corporate, um, I have to say, you know, a corporate uh, corporate's uh, mission is not to make startups successful, but to make themselves successful and more efficient. So, um, you know, um, the. Uh, you know, they, they, they don't need to kind of work with everyone or listen to everyone or, you know, uh, translate every pitch into a, a proof of concept and, um, you know, do it all, you know, multiple times over. So I think uh, what, what matters is their time and their funds are also limited and their people are also limited. So I think it's very important for a corporate to define the process, to define how they would experiment, um, make that scope very small and uh, clear uh, in terms of what success would look like at the end of that experiment, and then move fast. So if it fails, um, uh, then move fast, then, then switch it off, and then you know get to the next experiment. That that basically ensures that they're not wasting their time as well, and also not the startup's time. But they're also trying out these experiments and ideas, um, which enable them to figure out if that solution is real and it adds value to their own business. Because ultimately, they're a profit center. They need to make you know, their processes more efficient or make money. The second thing I would suggest, is, I would do, <laughs> is uh, um, you know, work, work with, bring the, bring the person who owns the problem um, to uh, the experiment. So the experiment is not run solely, let's say with the innovation team or with the startup team or the design team, but it's run with the person who owns the problem uh, and who sees that pain point and tries to say, does it move the needle on what my pain point is? Does it bring value to what I'm feeling on a day-to-day -day basis? Does this technology work for me? Would I feel bad if this is not existing? And only then, you know, so, the, so it's, it's a mix of the user and the decision maker um, and not just, you know, uh, the enablers who I, I think are the innovation teams. So I think those two things that I would, I would do if I were a corporate. You know, uh, we have come to the end of the panel sessions, uh, but before we end that, uh, I just want to uh, hear your views in terms of, you know, we have here so much uh, vibrancy in the fintech and other sectors and, uh, actually, there's a lot of opportunity space, a lot of problem statements to be solved within the maritime and the port industries. And if you look at just the fintech, I would say easily 50% of the people are looking at uh, payment solutions. I'm, if I look at it one after another, it's, it's still about payment and all those stuff. So actually, there's a lot of opportunities in the maritime space. And I just want to hear from all of you, uh, like, uh, you know, in the, um, the opportunity space uh, in the future of the maritime innovation ecosystem uh, system in Singapore, uh, if you can share your perspective in terms of what are the possibilities and opportunities uh, with the audience, and whether it, is it for the corporates as an investor or is it for the startups? Wow, that's a huge question, Thomas. That's a that's a that's like a webinar in itself. I think I think first of all, I think it's it's that entire maritime value chain. Um, many parts of it, including the regulations, come from a different era. Um, and so there are opportunities that exist. I think it's, I, I, I like to say that there are three really strong perspectives. There's the cargo perspective and everything around the cargo perspective is opportunities. There's the vessel perspective. 
everything around the vessel perspective is opportunities. And then there's the port perspective and everything around that, right from, you know, just in time, supply chain resilience, ETA capability, predictive. There's just like possibilities galore. I think the most important thing that really excites me about this is that, you know, maritime is a strategic industry in Singapore. Not many countries recognize that as a strategic industry. And I think that's important. I don't see a future where goods will not be transported physically from one part of the world to another part of the world. If that's the case, then maritime stays relevant. If that's the case, we need to seek efficiencies and we need to seek effectiveness, which means the world is our oyster. That was already a very good closing statement. I mean, it uh, encompasses all the yeah the opportunities around the uh, around the three uh, three parts mentioned. Well, I think the yeah the the opportunities that arise we have we we are at a very very interesting point at the moment because we um, I think we're just sort of scratching the surface at the moment of what's possible with within the maritime industry. Uh, we've seen that in, in 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 other industries as well. I I mean fintech is always mentioned because it's uh, very big uh, in 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 Singapore. But if we look at maybe other industries such as uh, aviation or uh, that where where which sort of maybe more comparable or uh, closer to 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 what we do, we see that that more is possible. So we are scratching the surface at the moment with uh, with, with innovation. So there are tons of opportunities at um, yeah, and in, in all the different segments. So for us, I mean, we are a ship owner and ship manager mostly, and there we already see tons of opportunities within the ship management sector, of course, because uh, we obviously uh, aim very high to see how we can we become uh, more efficient, fuel efficient, uh, of course, as well. Decarbonization is a big topic, although that is probably more research driven than 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 startup driven itself. So. There are many, many opportunities to work on for the startups to solve the problems with a with a with a fresh pair of eyes to see how how can we actually solve the problems that we sort of haven't really tackled in the last in the last fifty years, and for the corporates, um, yeah, we obviously work in a very competitive space, so um, there are many opportunities on that side and um for singapore as i as i mentioned before the we they already have one of the most active maritime startup ecosystems on the uh, on the early stage startups and to build on that to support uh, uh in the in the, on the different areas from regulatory point of view up to the the support for startups as well as smes and corporates Mm, and I think we will we will have a very thriving uh, or continue to have a very thriving ecosystem because we have the we certainly have the players. We see more corporates uh, in investing and engaging with startups. We see more startups. We see accelerator programs uh, coming into into the market, and all of that is a is a very positive sign. So I think I'll close with that. Well, well, I see a move towards more innovation, more collaboration across various uh, verticals in, in our chain. Um, and there'll be an increased focus, I would say, um, on environment, social and governance. Um, probably less that we will need an effective strategy towards, uh, towards more sustainable shipping. We will need technology and innovation to achieve this. And it's really a great, great, um, opportunity for more startups to come into this space to help us um, you know, move towards this direction. Um, but I would say what really would be exciting is that um, we, at this moment, are involved in the technology, technological evolution of the maritime industry. So we have a, a big part to play and it'll be just great to see it all come together very soon. Um, so I think there are three things that excite me about uh, being in this space and about the future of the ecosystem in Singapore. 
One, um, Thomas, like you mentioned, you're looking at uh, tripling the number of startups. So I'm looking forward to more competition. <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we would have built the right modes to be able to, you know, play in the same space. Um, second, I think uh, Meritime as an industry is generating millions of data points at every single you know, second that we talk about. So I'm looking forward to all the data that we're generating every single uh, sort of minute. And, uh, you know, as a data company, as an AI company, there's nothing better than that. Uh, with more and more technologies, sensors, blockchain, all of these technologies coming in, um, data becomes cleaner, available, um, and something that we can then create value from. So I, I, I think that is exciting. Uh, and then related to that is the open APIs and the data that you know uh, organizations like the MPA has started sharing. So I think I'm 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 really excited about the data. And then I also hope, and I think it is happening, is uh, you know the funding opportunities not just from the local entities or the investors, but you know investors from the US looking at Singapore and be able to take have that risk appetite that they can invest here. And I think we're starting to see that and also in the maritime space. Um, so I think we'll see more and more of that. And I think that is exciting. That helps companies like us get, a, you know, get, you know, sort of better funding opportunities, better platforms, better valuations. So I, I you know, that's exciting as well. So, um, you know, all of this uh, will basically enable companies like us to, um, you know, add a little bit of uh, value in the whole maritime chain to eventually help you know, all of us get our goods faster, cheaper, and on time. So uh, hoping to play a role in that. Yeah, thanks for your sharing and uh, lively, dis lively discussion. Uh, and uh, I want to thank uh, all the panelists, Naku, Heyman, Marion, and Nidhi uh, for the good session today. Uh, thank you very much. I'll hand over back to the MC. Thank you so much, panelists, for sharing your insights. That was a great discussion. So no shipping, no shopping. And it's exciting to hear all the opportunities that are available for startups. So now we're going to share a bit about SmartBot Challenge 2021. So to all the startups and entrepreneurs out there, if this sector is something that you're inspired to come and explore further, SmartBot Challenge could just be the right platform to help to kickstart your journey. So this challenge is brought to you by Pier 71 and TNB Ventures. It's supported also by Startup SG, an initiative by Enterprise Singapore the Economic Development Board, and also the Singapore Shipping Association. That's right. And this year, there are 21 maritime organizations and partners who put up 17 innovation opportunities covering areas in smart ports, smart ship, crew safety, training and well-being, maritime services and logistics, as well as green technologies. There are also a few opportunities that are jointly supported by several maritime corporates. And there are new areas we are, which we are looking at, for example, ship supplies, insurance, and many more. If you have promising solutions and technologies in any of the broader categories, you can submit them under the open category as well. Yep, and selected startups will then be invited to a six-week intense Accelerate program where they get to network with maritime corporates. And as we heard, that's really important to co-creating your solution. You will also gain access to uh, mentoring from industry veterans and business experts and also resources made available by our program partners. So this includes access to our VC partners, networks and expertise, access to lending pad resources and co-working space at Pier 71, and also access to the talent pool from the universities. So for those who are keen, what's next, Ning? Well, we'll find out more about all the 17 innovation opportunities from Pier 7's website. You will have to submit your entries by 10th of August. And all the information is available on the website at www.pier71.sg. Upon successful submission of your application, it will be evaluated by an expert panel, as well as the participating corporate sponsors. And only shortlisted candidates will be invited to an interview, and we will unveil the SmartPort Challenge 2021 cohort in September. And top finalists will be competing for cash prizes amounting to $18,000 at the grand finals in November. And all finalists who complete the program may also apply for the MPA grant, which will support you in developing your proof of concept and potentially join our 32 alumni who have received grants to develop and pilot their solutions with industry partners. So beyond the grant funding, we also continue to support our alumni in various ways, including access to markets, funding, tech, talent, infrastructure, and data. 
So make sure to follow us on LinkedIn for the latest updates. Mark your calendars as we deep dive into the innovation opportunities with the corporate partners. And thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. We look forward to receiving your applications. Thanks, everyone. Don't forget to drop by our startup booths to check out their innovations. See you at the next Peer 71 event.